So, Ross, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, I need to dismiss that. There we go. Okay, thank you very much, Evgeny, Dmitri, Dennis, for organizing this. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to meet everybody else. I'm Ross Gaylor. Uh, as keynotes go, this is probably somewhere between um, low key and no key. So uh, you get what you pay for. Uh, all right, so let's see how far we get with this. Uh, this is approximately a content free talk. Uh, so basically, I'm not talking about, oh, here's some work I've been doing or whatever. Uh, I'm talking about how I think about doing work, should I ever get around to doing it. Um, and one of the things that, that strikes me is, obvious. if you have, um, if you consider uh, VSAHDC, it, it's much like a mathematical system. There's a very small number of operators, and it's, it's very simple in its origin. And yet you, you're trying to then create this structure on top of it. Um, and you think if you, uh, if you were somebody who wasn't a mathematician and you somebody told you, here's three axioms. Now go away and recreate mathematics from it. Um, it's quite a difficult task. So I think that everybody has, when they're working in any field of endeavor, uh, a set of auxiliary beliefs around their, their, you know, the core stuff they're working with. So in this case, it's you know you, you have I believe you know beliefs about the VSA components and how they relate to each other and how they relate to other things you know, um, and that you use this this auxiliary information, this conceptual framework to reason about to help you. So it's basically like getting handles and gluing the handles onto the VSA concept so you can move them around and join them up with each other and so on. Uh, so this is this is essential. And the point about these sorts of beliefs is ideally they should be productive. They're there to help you do whatever it is you're doing. So, and the thing is, it's I, you, you very rarely hear people talk about it. So I thought it might be interesting uh, to talk about it. these sorts of beliefs. I mean, they're not they're not theoretical constructs as such. Uh, they, you know, they're not necessarily true. They're not even necessarily true or false. You know, there could be things like metaphors. You know, I think you know, permutation is like a plate of spaghetti. I mean, maybe that helps me to think about <laughs> and and use use the concept. But um, you know, it's it doesn't have a truth value. Uh, and that you know, taken as a whole, these beliefs are not necessarily coherent. They're not necessarily stable over time because you know, hopefully, I you know, they will evolve as I better understand what I'm doing. Um, they're likely to be idiosyncratic, which is a bit of a shame um, because, you know, it means that something that's helpful to me might not be helpful to anybody else, in which case I'm wasting your time with the talk, but hey. Right? Um, and, you know, if they were in some sense canonical, this is the right way to think about it, then it should be part of theory uh, rather than, um, sorry, technical problem? No? Okay. It should be part of the theory rather than, you know, just some person's private thoughts. But anyway, to, to me, these sorts of auxiliary beliefs are, are gambles. So basically, the person who's holding these beliefs is betting that they're a useful way to, to help you think about the problems you're working on. And the organisation, yep, okay. So it's my conceptual framework. I've got no idea what yours is. We don't talk about it. Um, mine might be bleedingly obvious to you. Sorry, I've wasted your time. Um, on the other hand, maybe not. Maybe they're deeply interesting. Uh, the framework, my framework, I think is sort of this densely connected web of different points. And it's sort of everything is related to everything else somewhat. Um, so there's no obvious logical path. I can't sort of say, here, here's the starting point and we'll work in a nice path to it. So the consequence is this talk is basically a random walk through this, this graph of, of concepts. Uh, so, you know, I'm just basically going to pick a few sort of salient topics walk randomly in the neighborhood and occasionally say, well, this is a bit like something or other else and yeah. it's up to you to do something with it. Okay, uh, actual content. Um, I've actually spoken about this before. If, you, if it's interesting, there's a talk I gave at Berkeley some years back, which sort of expands on this topic, but I find it useful. So this is, yeah, I like to, I like to understand things, which me understanding is in terms of casting one domain into a whole bunch of relationships in other domains. I think that helps me. So, okay, here's our question. What is a hypervector? Yeah, a vector in general. 
So yeah, it basically, so it's, it's, it's a direction in some space plus a, a magnitude. Now, uh, for those of you who are old enough, which is almost nobody here, uh, who's seen an electronic analog computer, uh, fascinating devices, you can use them to solve uh, mathematical problems. And the, they're organized as a set of electronic circuits, which implement functions like integration, differentiation, addition, and so on. And you're representing quantities of interest as voltages in these circuits. And programming them consists of having a big switchboard and you're plugging wires in to connect this box up with that box. And quite literally, you know, these the, the wires are the programming mechanism and the voltage on any particular wire is represents the magnitude of some quantity you're interested in, like the, the acceleration of uh, some particle in the suspension of a car that you're simulating. But the meaning of the symbol isn't, sorry, the meaning of that wire the, is not in the wire. It's often literally a post-it note with something scribbled on it, like you know, a second derivative of X posted onto the outside of that wire, which says what the meaning is. So it's a label on that. So I think uh, if we look at vectors, hypervectors, we can interpret them as being like these components of our analog computers, that you know, the, the magnitude of the vector is equivalent to the signal magnitude in the analog computer, and we interpret the direction of the vector as being the label on that signal. It's telling you what that signal is supposed to correspond to. And the really interesting thing, or a couple of interesting things about uh, this is that these labels are composite because you know, there is a sequence of operations you have carried out which results in the direction of this vector. So you can interpret these labels as being composite and you can you know, compose them and decompose them using the operations uh, within the VSA world. And uh, the other I mean, really nice point relative to an electronic analog computer is that the labels themselves are represented within the system. Whereas in an electronic analog computer, yeah, the labels are outside the system. They're the post-it notes on the wires. So that, that's an interesting possibility that you know, the labels themselves are able to be computed with within the system. And you can create labels on the fly. You know, you, you know, bind A with B. Okay, well, you know, now I've got a new, a new label. So uh, it's, it's quite an interesting way, I think, to, to think about VSA systems as being like analog computers. Analog computers for computation over discrete structures. Uh, now, then you can think, well, okay, I've got this potentially quite complex label, but the value I'm representing is just the scalar magnitude of the vector. Is that limiting? Too limiting for us? Do we want structured values in some sense? Well, what you can do in that case is, no, you can't. Yeah, the magnitude is always limited to be just a scalar value. But what you can do is you can try to reflect values of interest into the label itself. So you could have, my label is binding of color with red. So you can interpret that as being a predicate. That's, you know, the, the magnitude is saying yes or no, it's true or not that the color, the value of the color is, is red. You know, your, your decomposition into what's a variable and what's a value within that variable is, is up to you. You know, likewise, you know, height is you know, bound with some encoding of 180 centimeters. Uh, in which case, you know, you interpret the uh, you know, the label as being a predicate of some sort, and the the magnitude could be you could interpret as a truth value or some degree of support or a probability, something like that. Um, now, if you're thinking of the magnitude as say a, a uh, some degree of support or a probability, you might want to um, restrict the values of the magnitudes to be non-negative. So I mean, you can, it's sort of weird in, in vector world that uh, you, you can, you've got negative values on magnitudes, but that's really means, you know, is, it, is it really that there's a negative value or is it a positive magnitude on a vector which is pointing in the opposite direction? You know, you've got the freedom to, to see it either way. Uh, so if for your purposes, you wanted to constrain things to be non-negative, then you can do that by effectively using negation as an operation in your construction of the label. And so you're putting the negative in the label and saying, but I'm always going to take the magnitude as being possible. Um, just a side issue, I think yeah, we talk about you know, binding and bundling or just you know, some product operators. 
and, uh, and permutation. But I think that we should much more often also speak about having inverse operators, you know, uh, additive inverse and multiplicative inverse, and talk about the um, identity values, you know, the equivalence of zeros and ones, and you know, make it look more like we're actually doing real, you know, proper, a proper algebra. Uh, you know, just your know, personal prejudice, I don't like talking about an unbinding operator, I'd rather talk about, you know, multiplying with the multiplicative inverse. Um, then you don't have to remember which way around, you know, what's the order of the arguments, the unbind operator, personal prejudice. Um, but anyway, I mean, if you were uh, if you were doing some sort of a computation with the say system where this issue of non-negativity was important, then you would probably have to do something in the implementing hardware to enforce that constraint. Because um, you know, you think in a uh, in general, okay, vector space, arbitrary vectors. What does it mean for something to be non-negative in that? I mean, because you know, a, ran a vector at random could go this way, or it could just go in completely the opposite direction. There's sort of no natural directionality to the items as such. You know, there, there's there are no privileged directions in this space uh, if you're just talking about randomly generated vectors. But if you were to talk about having a cleanup memory, so you're now taking some directions and you're privileging them by putting them in a cleanup memory, uh, then you can say right. I will set it up so that I can only ever produce as an output. This value, the, you know, the negative, the, the negation of that will never come out in the output. Um, you know, one very simple cleanup memory is effectively a, a, a vector matrix multiplication. You're projecting onto the subspace spanned by the items in the, um, in the cleanup memory. Uh, and in that case, you, know, you could you know, effectively on the input side of that, you're constructing the dot products of the input with each of the items in the memory. Uh, and you, you, know, you can basically constrain that so that it's, you know, the dot products will never go below zero. And you're producing then a weighted sum of those items as the output. So yeah, I, the only point of that last bit of uh, was that it's you know, if you actually want to make this have some impact within the computation, then of course, you've got to make it happen in the hardware somehow or other. Uh, you probably can't just wave your hands and say you are non-negative. Uh, labels can go come all right so one of the really one of the things which struck me very early about this field is everything's just a vector um, it makes life so much so much simpler you don't have to worry about transforming things from from one format to another format it's you know everything is automatically of the same sort of the same computational sort um, so in good old-fashioned AI, you'd have data structures representing things. You'd have frames, and those would have you know, fancy word for records. Uh, and in those, they'd have you know, attributes. So these would be called slots or fields or what have you. Um, and so if you had uh, role value, slot filler, whatever you want to call it, in the, the slots, the fields, the attributes in old-fashioned AI, symbolic AI, would typically be atomic symbols. They'd be things like color height, and so on. So they have no internal structure. It's just, you know, this is the variable. That's it. End of story. But in VSA, because everything is just a vector, the labels on the fields, the variable names, can be arbitrarily complex structures in their own rights because it's just a vector. So you, know, you might have stored as your role filler binding some, some value, which we'll call, you know, go to kitchen and look in fridge with the value beer. And this value here might actually be something like the, the encoding, the representation of a, you know, some sort of a finite state machine which runs your robot, which is a sensory motor program, which causes it to get up, go into the kitchen, look inside the refrigerator and report the, uh, the contents of uh, whatever is in there. And so you know, this then becomes a, um, you know, effectively you know, saying you, your system has the belief that there's beer in the fridge. But, it's actually the, the role value, which is incredibly complicated here. I think that's that's really cool and something that we uh, don't use enough. Okay. Uh, slightly different slope and everything's just a value. The point is that in a VSA system, you know, we, we might have here's a complex series of operations which is being used to construct uh, a vector. The point is that the hardware doesn't see <coughs> that series of operations, it doesn't in any way 
carry it around permanently. All it sees is the value that results from executing that series of, of operations. Uh, consequently, so yeah, this is getting back to that label interpretation. If I had constructed this uh, vector as by A plus B, and then on another occasion, I'd constructed uh, a vector using B plus A, and assuming that that's addition is, is commutative in this, uh, in good old fashioned AI world, if I was talking about labels, I'd have to demonstrate that this label actually was equivalent to that label. But in VSA world, uh, because we're just dealing with values, this value is identical to that value by virtue of the commutativity. So you don't have to worry about um, you know, equivalences and symmetries and that sort of thing. That you know, if it if it turns out to be an equal value as far as the system is concerned, they're all the same thing. They have the same value. Um, more complex version of that is that um, Tony's uh, circular convolution binding is you know, a one way of uh, taking your two vectors, creating the tensor product, and summing them down in a particular way to result in a uh, in a lower dimensional vector. Uh, but you can, yeah. Ultimately, it's it's just a sum of individual elements, which are products of elements from from the arguments. You can uh, reorder that and show that it's actually also equivalent to, so if it's a D-dimensional vectors you're working with, it's a, a bundling, a summing over D-many bindings, Hadamard bindings of permutations of the arguments. So it's, you know, they are identical. The system doesn't know nor care that you know, those two things are the, are the same thing, yet they are the same value as far as it's concerned. So these, these symmetries and sort of how do I generalize over them if I've only seen A plus B, but I've never seen B plus A, that goes away. Um, other point to make in that is that this is sort of, if you like, exact mathematical equality, but there's also another uh, area that because we're dealing with finite physical systems in implementing these, uh, there's this sort of concept of noise. I mean, we abuse the term horribly. It's used in multiple different senses. Uh, but um, one of the senses is, you know, if you've got hardware maybe the implementation is noisy in some way or other. So if you're using phase representations, maybe there's some inherent uncertainty in the representation of the phases. Um, but whatever, at some point, you can, you know, you can be creating things which are mathematically different, but practically from the system's point of view, will end up being the same value just because they get, you know, the difference between them gets lost in the noise. So you might have A plus B plus C, blah, 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 or a few thousand things plus Y, and exactly the same set of things at the end, you add in you know, plus Z. Uh, and you know, maybe as far as the system is concerned, it can't tell the difference between them. So I mean, that's essentially one explanation of these uh, bundling capacity kind of, uh, kind of arguments. You know, you, you're basically saying the difference between things which are mathematically distinct gets lost in the, in the noise. So they're effectively uh, equivalent. All right, oh, dear me. What are we doing? You know what? I might skip that one. Uh, oh. No, okay, now very quickly. All right, so it just follows on from that last point. Um, that if you consider, start off with an empty vector space, and you then say, I've got a bunch of atomic hypervectors. So off they go, they're at random, and they're widely spaced. In this space, then you say, okay, now let me uh, apply operators to those. So basically, I create expressions uh, and I create all possible expressions and I do it in order of increasing length of expression. So, great, I'm going to get more exponentially more of the vectors, and the space is going to get, start to get crowded. And some of these expressions are just going to overlap mathematically, like A plus B is equal to B plus A. So, those, you know, those are the same thing. But you'll also get some expressions which get crowded out for that noise region reason. So I've got you know, A plus B turns out to look exactly the same as the, uh, the vector representing some enormously long expression. Uh, point is from the system's point of view, it can't tell the difference between those. Those are the same thing. They've got the same value, they're pointing in the same direction. <clears throat> so I, um, I would argue that that's, that's sort of a, implies a form of Occam's razor in there that basically, you know, there's a, there's a whole series of more complicated explanations for what things are, which the, the system can't tell the difference between them and the, uh, 
and uh, and, a, and a simpler explanation of how the, that label arose. So, yeah, whether that's true or not, no, yes, Tony. <laughs> it seemed your last point. Wouldn't it be more accurate to say it implies a need for a form of Occam razor? Um, because I don't like yes. what you're saying. Yeah. You, but yeah. I don't see anything in the system yeah. that will implement that yeah. difference. Yeah. That's like, right. Okay. So, all right. Given that this was on at 2 a.m., um, the. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you're quite right. I think it's that the. What you get out of the representation is stuff that makes it easy to implement an Occam's razor. So then I think, the, you know, you, to carry it through to Occam's razor as normally understood, it would then be that if you had some system, you know, some dynamics in a circuit, which was trying to, say, decompose a label into its components, so basically tell you how the label got there, that effectively there would have to be a, um, a bias in the system so that it would so that the shorter description is the more available and is the one that it would normally arrive at. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, okay, similarities. All righty. Um, similarity, central to reasoning. I mean, my interest is in recurrent systems. Uh, so I'm interested in the, you know, the dynamics of the systems. You, know, the, you pump in some values and you watch how the state of the system evolves over time. And uh, similarity is central to reasoning about that kind of, that kind of dynamics because you know, basically it's all about dot products and you know, what's the projection of some part of the system onto the current state, which then effectively you know, turns into an update on the, on the state. Um, so I just gonna say, you know, the, the the appropriate similarity metric for similar uh, for VSIE systems is the angle, and it's something that's you know equivalent to the angle to between the vectors, so you know dot product ish thing. And the, the, you know the reason it's appropriate is because it respects the nature of these things as vectors, uh, because vectors are defined with respect to an origin. So you know you've got you know vector has effectively two points to it. You've got the arrow end and the the head end and the tail end of the vector. Uh, whereas if you were just thinking of these as sort of in terms of something like Euclidean, Euclidean dis distance, you're only interested in the locations of, of the heads of the, uh, the arrows. Um, and so, yeah, if you have, if you, and I have seen some people doing work um, where they're saying, oh, well, I'm using a Euclidean distance. So the point is that the Euclidean distances between the points, which are the tips of the vectors, is invariant to translation of the origin of the space. Uh, whereas the angles between the vectors is absolutely not. You know, here's a, a nice little compact cluster of vectors pointing out in various directions. So they're all sort of, you know, vectors all over the place. Take the origin from here, pull it by the hell over here, and suddenly everything's very correlated because all the vectors are going from there over to these same points here. Uh, so that's you know, just an argument saying, yes, you know, angles and, and dot products are the appropriate uh, similarity metric. However, if you constrain the system, it turns out that you know, distances and angles can be equivalent. So you know, if you say, oh, all my points, all my vectors are constrained to lie on the surface of a hypersphere, uh, then you get a, a, a mapping between the, um, uh, the, the Euclidean distances and, and the angles. So in, if you take uh, Hamming distance, which is basically you've constrained all the points to be on the surface of a hypercube, uh, there's just a linear transform from the Hamming distance to uh, the, the dot product of the, the vectors. Um, so it's not as doom and gloom as that sounds, but you've got to be aware of, you know, it works if it's constrained, it doesn't work if it's unconstrained. Um, and that gets down to implicit assumptions. I mean, so a lot of everybody all the time says eh, something, and you know, what they don't is, what they don't tell you is, Here's a bunch of assumptions here, which I don't even necessarily know I'm making myself, um, which may have an impact on the result. Okay, uh, here's imagination time. Imagine we've got a hypervector representing the state of our VSA system, and it's it's the North Pole. So a bit north, north here. We're standing on top of this vector. We're looking down onto the surface of this hypersphere. So basically, we're looking at one hemisphere, and the equator, the equatorial belt, is out in the distance all around us. And 
the um, you know, our standard concentration of measure thing is that the hemisphere that we're standing on top of is almost entirely unpopulated. If we're just you know, throwing out random vectors into the space, almost everything lives out in the equatorial belt relative to wherever we happen to be. Uh, now, this bit here, Imagine I haven't actually written that because I think it's very poorly explained there, but it's, <laughs> thank you. Uh, um, I mean, similarity is between pairs of vectors. And I'm looking at the interaction between the operations that you can apply in VSA and the impact of those on similarity. And the claim, which is possibly better stated than that there is that when you're talking about things which are within your hemisphere, so you're standing on top of your hemisphere and you can see that there are some points within the hemisphere sufficiently far from the equatorial belt as to be not quasi-orthogonal. So basically anything that's inside your hemisphere is related to you. It's similar to you. And uh, to me, that's all about, that's all about bundling, bundling. It's about adding uh, because that's the mechanism which changes similarity. So you can use um, bundling to pull something from the equator up into your hemisphere. Whereas binding is primarily about either you know, moving things around the equator or moving them within, within your hemisphere, but to another location, which is just as similar <laughs> within, your, within your hemisphere. So the wishy-washy argument here is that Similarity is great and we need it, but it's primarily about, about bundling. And it, it only applies to an astonishingly small fraction of all of the vectors which exist within a given system, because most of the pairs of vectors are living in the equator relative to wherever you are. Uh, so, bunch of speculation, whatever hand wavy thing, is that we need to have other other measures of similarity, which are not angular similarity, in order to drive the dynamics of the system where the driving mechanism is binding rather than bundling. Okay. So I think, uh, simplify this, that you know, for permutation and, uh, and product, that there's something more like an, uh, an edit distance is sort of even a more appropriate metric of, of similarity. It's, you know, how easy is it to get from this location to that location via uh, a series of operators? Uh, and then, you know, if there are differences in those, then those might be effective within the dynamics for choosing between transforms to a point. Uh, fly in the ointment there is that every place is only one binding away from every other place if you're allowed to use a completely arbitrary binding. So I think that you know, for this to make sense, it all needs to go via the notion of things like cleanup memories and so on. So there's a set of operators which are available to you because they involve the items that you care about. Whereas if you allow just any old random item, then everything is just right next to everything else. Um, yeah. Hurried bindings is, is obviously just, it's referring to rather than taking a binding with two arguments, you're already including one of the arguments into the binding. So the, you know, the operator is bind with A or bind with B as a, so you've then got a whole palette full of those operators. Ah, okay. Um, this one, right. As in the work that we do in VSA, we, we seem to concentrate entirely on the observable hypervector. So yeah, here's a vector, there's a vector, and we, we treat them like, um, computer data structures. It is this thing. It's it's sort of a point thing. It has a very specific value. This is it. This is what it is. Um, I want to change the focus a bit to an unobservable reality rather than the observable stuff we've got. Um, this comes from being corrupted by life as an applied statistician. Uh, most statistics is about inferring the state of some sort of unobservable reality from some set of measurements that you have. So, you know, you've, you've got your logistic regression model and you're trying to infer what is the probability conditional on X of that this, um, this observation will do something rather well. You know, the, that probability is not directly observable. It's not written into the, into the structure of the thing. You have to infer it from the information you've got. 
So what I'm suggesting is it might be useful to view hypervectors as realizations of observable measurements, which are related to some observable, unobservable latent reality, which is what we're actually trying to get our hands onto. And that's a more useful point of view, especially if you're into cognitive robotics stuff and you're, you're, you're basically saying, I'm, I'm doing this VSA not as a mathematical exercise, but because I want my agent to be able to infer the state of the world. But, you know, it, state of the world is entirely inferred. You know, I don't have direct access to reality. It's all, you know, some random photon is, is, is bump, bouncing off you. It happens to bounce into some, you know, randomly selected... Um, photoreceptor in my eye, and I'm you know, trying to reconstruct the world from that. Okay, uh, and this might have something to say about the role of randomness in VSA. Uh, so that's what I was just saying, that we, you know, nobody has direct access to reality. It's mediated by measurements, which are very indirect. Uh, so you know, imagine looking at an object. Gazillions of, of atoms in, in Chris here, which particular ones happen to be sending, you know, bouncing, reflecting photons in my direction? It's just a you know, random choice out of the empty gazillion atoms. Uh, likewise, you know, when the photon plows into my eye, which particular photoreceptor out of all the photoreceptors there is effectively a random choice. So randomness all over the place. So what I'm suggesting is you've got, I'm just shying away from saying infinite, uh, but call it ultra dimensional. So there's this vector of, all the possible measurements that could have been made and viewing that you know, the hypervector we actually have is effectively a random projection from that. So we just select some of these measurements at random and plonk them into a hypervector. So we're now saying that um, we're viewing the elements of the hypervector as these functions, phi i is the subscript of the, the element uh, of x, where x is the reality. So basically each of the elements of your hypervector is some function from reality, the particular current reality, to the, the VSA base field, you know, complex numbers or binaries or whatever. And what we want to do is to infer the reality despite the, the randomness of the sample, uh, to which I have no answer immediately. Uh, I think you know, the interesting things about these measurements are that the, the VSI system itself doesn't know the shape of the, all those individual functions. And they'll all be different. Uh, it knows the value, yes, you know, one or zero, or you know, plus one or minus one or whatever. Uh, and we want those measurements to be both individually informative about the reality, because if there's no, you know, functional relationship, then we obviously can't infer. But all, and also collectively, so we can't have, you know, if we would have exactly the same function repeated ten thousand times, well, that's not going to tell us any more than just knowing it once. So, so obviously means we need to have. You know the functions need to capture the you know those properties of X that we care about, uh, and uh, you know the information in this hypervector is is basically carried by the covariation between the elements of the hypervector, which is induced by variation over the possible realities it could be exposed to. And if we allow that, no. All these individual element functions are you know, there's no such thing as a privileged function. Then to me that implies that you've got to have robustness because if if nothing is special, then it doesn't really matter whether it's there or not. I mean, you know, something else would do. Uh, that you know effectively the distribution is is inherently rep, uh, distributed. Sorry, representation is inherently distributed, and that they're also unordered. I mean, you know, the ordering of the elements within the hypervector is totally irrelevant. It's just they're different. Uh, which is a point that comes up later. Okay, now an interesting uh, interpretation of that, I think, is that these measurements might be viewed as constraints. So let's let's imagine the VSA base field is binary. Uh, and so we've... Sorry, I think I skipped over something there. No, oh, sorry, this line here. So effectively, each of these, um, each of these functions, element functions, I think it's yeah, appropriate to think of them as basically being a hash function from X to your, your base field, because uh, that gives you the, sort of the kinds of properties you want. Okay, so that being so, if our hash function, hash functions plural, one for each of the elements, uh, basically result in a, an even distribution, which would be most maximally informative for the outcome. So if you've got just a hypervector with one element, basically 
it divides the world in half. You've got the zero, you've got the one. It divides all the possible realities. And then if you've got uh, a hypervector, which is longer, uh, then obviously, yeah, as you keep adding elements, if they're uncorrelated with each other, then effectively you're just dividing that set smaller and smaller. So basically the, the vector as a whole is computing the intersection of the dichotomies associated with each of the um, uh, with each of the elements. So I think uh, where this ends up with is sort of seeing measurements as constraints rather than a sort of point point measurements. Um, so now because we're sure it's one exact specific hypervector, but what it's specifying is actually a set of realities that are consistent with the hypervector you've got. Uh, and basically what you're saying is that um, it's, it is saying, yeah, there is a set of realities which are indistinguishable with respect to the particular hypervector I've got at the moment. Um, I think that's, that I think is, is interesting because you, you're no longer saying, oh, I have a representation of exactly this thing. You're now saying my representation stands for an entire set of things that are consistent with the measurements I've got. And so I think that that, yeah, this is purely speculative stuff. Um, if you're considering a search process, it might be the case that that could make search easier because you're not finding an exact solution. You're essentially saying, well, I just need to find a space which contains a solution, um, which might be an easier computational task. Uh, and then if you're saying, well, you know, constraints and depending on the, uh, the dimensionality of your vector and other things, uh, you're basically making your intersections smaller or larger. So you really only need sufficient dimensionality in your hypervector to make the distinctions you need to make. So you've got you know, the possibility of optimizing the dimensionality. And I've certainly seen that in some you know, papers recently where people are saying, uh, oh, you know, I'm doing this particular task and I you know, initially did it with a 10,000 dimensional vector, but hey, I could get it down to 60 or whatever. Um, you might, you know, hardware-wise, and you have to hold your scepticism in check, but you know, maybe, uh, maybe it opens the possibility of thinking about dynamic dimensionality. Is it possible to have a system where the dimensionality of the, of the vectors varies uh, over the course of the computation, depending on how fine a distinction you need to make? And if you're interpreting uh, the um, elements as being uh, primitive constraints, the elements of the vectors as being primitive constraints, uh, you've got the uh, you know, this notion of dynamic dimensionality is effectively about adding and subtracting uh, constraints. Uh, so adding and constructing measurements. Would it be possible uh, to you know, create a system where you can actually create new measurements on the fly? So if we're thinking of an element as being a hash function from reality, uh, is, would it make sense to say, I will actually create a new, a new element which has highly desirable properties with respect to the particular problem we're doing at the moment. So that's that's all hand wavy stuff, but interesting of it. Okay. Again, corrupted by a lifetime as an applied statistician. This is to do with the interpretation of um, the algebraic structure of uh, of a vector. So you know, typically, you know, you'll propose some set of operations and you'll, you'll, you'll write down in your paper, this is a nice example, oh, yeah, A plus B times C, et cetera. And you know, you're looking at that as, a, uh, you know, as an expression, but you know, because of the slogan earlier, everything's just a value. Well, you know, the, the hardware doesn't see it as such. The hardware just sees it as a value. That's, that's all right. It, it's more about how do, we, how do we interpret what's going on in that vector? So, in the statistics, your standard statistical data structure is just a matrix, nice rectangular data structure. And your rows of the matrix are cases, observations, whatever. And your columns are variables or features, depending on which cultural camp you come from. And that can include predictors and outcomes or whatever. Now, <clears throat> your columns in that are structurally orthogonal. You know, basically, you know, it's, they form a basis but the vector space, you know, they're, they're independent in that I can change the value in this column completely independently of whatever value I put in, in that column. So that's fine. And that's, that's how it works. And uh, typically these features are often single columns. So it might be, you know, what's somebody's weight? What's somebody's height? Single column each. 
but you can also have features can be spread across multiple, so logical features can be spread across multiple columns. So you might have, what's the category of this? Uh, you know, what language are we talking in? And I've, you, know, you could use one hot encoding. So it's, you know, English, Svenska, whatever. Um, so that's the world in which things like regression operate. And we do use uh, statistical techniques like regression in the VSA world. So you might, you know, if you're doing something like the readout matrix from a uh, uh, from an echo state network, you know, that's that's basically a, a ridge regression. Um, so you would hope that statistics would have something to say useful about uh, a grid world, uh, sorry, VSA world. Uh, and this last point is that, you know, statistical modeling like regression is about exploiting the covariation between feature values, which is induced by variation over cases. Um, and that's basically what we're talking about with that view of the individual elements as being, as being measurements. Now, where that leads to is we could think of the algebraic terms in a hypervector as being rotated features in a, in a statistical model. So if we did our, if we had our statistical data set, set with nice separate columns for height and weight and so on, we could rotate the basis of that data space, which would have exactly the same information content, except that now the values, the features could be spread over all the columns in that matrix. And the thing which allows it to work in a regression setting is that the, the directions corresponding to what were originally separate columns are still orthogonal to each other in the new uh, data space. So it works if you've got rotation uh, inducing with orthogonality. So in VSA, we can use regression to predict, to extract predictions from hypervectors. As I said, you, know, if, you, know, you can, it's sort of a normal form, algebraic normal form uh, for hypervectors. So you, you'll end up with something which is a sum of, of terms. I'm saying that you know, these algebraic terms in general are orthogonal. And that what we should do is say, oh, this is a data set that's going into a regression. And a simple term like A um, is equivalent to a main effect in a, in a regression. And things like uh, bindings, A bind B, is equivalent to an interaction term in a statistical model. So if you come from a statistical background, you, you say, oh, okay, I understand this. I now can do things with this. So, um, so we can understand you know, regression and classification systems in DSA as being you know, like exactly what you do with a, um, with a statistical model. Uh, so with the integer echo state network, um, so essentially uh, NTSN is building up a representation in, in its reservoir, which is the stock standard, uh, or, you know, a stock standard uh, representation of a sequence. So it's a sum of terms and the terms represent the value that was seen one time step ago, two time steps ago, three time steps ago, and so on. And yeah, they are each separate algebraic terms. And that just maps directly onto saying, hey, I'm doing a regression and my, uh, my columns are lagged values of the lagged input values. Um, so that's sort of interpreting what something is doing. On the other hand, perhaps we can use this to uh, design something we're doing. If we're saying, I'm, I'm doing a, building a VSA system. I wanted to have a certain properties. How would I do this if this were just a statistical problem? And then we can say, oh, I, I know that. Now I can translate that into what that would look like in VSA. Uh, so Kenny and Dennis and I and Ben Norbert were uh, involved in this uh, epileptic seizure challenge. Uh, what it is not relevant currently, but uh, we had a, a set of uh, predictors, so mini rocket uh, predictors, which were used in a time series prediction problem. And we hypothesized, you know, actually, what we'd like is for the impact of each of these features to vary as a function of time of day. So uh, what that means is, you know, statistically, we need an interaction between each of these features and time of day. And uh, you know, the VSA version of this already had a VSA representation of the features. So we then came up with a VSA representation of time of day and just created the binding of time of day representation with other feature representation. And that then created for us a model which had all the interactions in it, uh, which we get. we incidentally won that challenge too. That's nice. Um, okay, getting there. Right, personal B in the bonnet. 
Let me touch the indices. Um, most people, I think, with a with a computing background, tend to think of the indices of a vector as consecutive integers. Zero and upwards if you're a Python person, one and upwards if you're an R person or whatever. Uh, but that's actually imposing more structure than is strictly necessary uh, for, the, for the task. The, you know, the, the point I was making before about viewing the hypervectors as being a sequence of a, a set of measurements is that that set is inherently unordered. Uh, and that's why one of the reasons you know, permutation works is the actual ordering of the elements within the vector is not, doesn't, doesn't directly make a difference. So we don't need those. You know, we do need the the uh, uh, the indices to be unique. So they could be you know sad, b, hot, whatever you like. They're just different, uh, and they certainly don't need to be ordered. Uh, and so the the, the ordering, I think, partly comes from people were building you know printed circuit boards, a two D layout. I want to lay out a circuit on a board, and uh, if you're doing that, then it's really convenient to think of uh, the elements of a vector as being ordered because it's all to do with you know, laying out wires on the surface of the circuit board and not having a horrible mess of spaghetti. They're all running nice and parallel to each other. But if, for example, you're talking about a neural implementation, you know, there's no canonical one-dimensional ordering of the items in a, you know, in a 3D space. So in a way, it's an, it's an imposition on the designer for them to be thinking, oh, I need to keep these, these elements ordered. It's, it's, it's not inherent to that. Anyway, uh, if we are uh, saying, okay, this is just a set, an unordered set of values, all these elements, one way we could think of that is as key value pairs. Yeah, the ith element, be it one or sad, has a value which is you know, the value of the complex number or whatever, whatever happens to be the, uh, the base field of that element. Um, so really, a vector is just a sum of a large number of key value pairs. Yeah. The, the label of the measurement and the value on the base field that it maps to. Uh, again, does this sound familiar? Um, early on, there was you know, you're talking about you know, key value, key value pairs and things, and and also, I mean, just in in VSA world, we know how to deal with key value pairs. We do bindings, um, so it's sort of interesting. This is sort of, sort of proceeding recursively down into the basement of hypervectors and starting to think of the individual elements of the vectors in ways that are like the way we think about the vectors as a whole. Um, okay, if you take that view that there's no inherent linear ordering uh, to the elements of the vector, um, then it really doesn't make sense to talk of permutation in isolation. So, yeah, I've got a hypervector here. I permute it. I send the output out in a wire, which doesn't connect to anything else. Have I really permuted it? I mean, it's not going anywhere. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing to recognize that, oh, this element has moved from here to there. Um, so I really think, I don't think it makes sense to talk of permutation relative to another vector. It's only when you when you take a vector and commute it and then combine it with another vector somehow or other and find out that the result is different from the result you would have got if you hadn't permuted it. Um, so that's the, you know, the context in which permutation uh, makes sense, I think. And it's all about just basically tracking which elements are being combined. So if I've got a vector A, uh, you know, called the subscripts of the elements, you know, A1, A2, A, et cetera, uh, vector B, similar naming scheme, and I've permuted it, then, you know, the sum of those is, you know, it'll be a vector X, and it'll have elements in it, like the first element will be, you know, the magnitude of this, well, sorry, the, the value of the, the base value of that plus the base value of that, but the subscript we can construct um, systematically to reflect the fact that it is a combination of those elements from the other ones, which is then beginning to sound an awful lot like the, the original analog computers and labels on wires description. So is it possible to think about and keep track of where the elements are going to? Uh, so in a tensor product, and so, you know, it, you, you've probably seen the arguments that I think it was uh, Frank Chu uh, in his uh, VSA online talk was doing some category theoretic stuff where he was basically saying, 
the tensor product is the source of all the power of, of what's going on in VSA, that essentially all the other binding operators are uh, projections from the tensor product to, to some other space. So it, it's sort of the, the it, it's in some sense the most basic uh, way of doing a, a binding. Uh, but yeah, you look at tensor product, it's just the outer product of, of, of two vectors. Um, what makes it, I think, you know, what makes it a tensor product from the mathematical point of view is basically the pattern of combination of the elements of the arguments going into that. And the fact that effectively you can keep track of that and use it to guide later things like tensor contractions. Uh, so you, do, you, know, you don't need to keep them as these nice rectangular arrays and, and cubes and, and what have you. Uh, that's just a handy way of doing the bookkeeping to keep track of what goes where you could potentially do exactly the same thing with an unordered mess of elements, <laughs> as long as the labels on the elements uh, allowed you to, to, to do, replicate the bookkeeping. Um, so again, you know, the, each of the elements in here, you can think of as being key value pairs, uh, and you could represent those as hypervectors. So this is, you know, this is, this is the big ask here. Could we in some sense self-embed VSA within itself uh, representing individual elements of a vector using vectors themselves uh, to, to represent them. I mean, that's probably, in the first instance, fairly mad. Uh, but the uh, I think the thing about it is one of the really nice points about VSA is this notion that you can create new representational elements on the fly. So this is getting back to what I was saying before about measurements and maybe being able to create uh, new measurements with exactly the right properties, in which case you could have, you know, your hypervector could be just one element uh, if it was exactly the right element. Um, this is it's sort of more an interpretation of, is that what we're actually doing with VSA? When we're creating a binding of something, is what we're doing actually equivalent to um, creating a single element vector, <laughs> uh, but it happens to be just the right element to do the job anyway? Okay, and that, I think, is pretty much as much stuff as I've got. Uh, enough rubbish for one day. <laughs> um, thank you, Ross. Thank you. So we have time for questions, and then we can continue with the discussions while we're taking a coffee uh, outside. So any immediate questions, too. I have to see the paper. What, what, what paper are we talking about? Yeah, thoughts, like this thought that you're giving. Uh, these thoughts are only in this <laughs> in this presentation, uh, which will eventually be available. But I mean, that's it. Textual description. Uh, yeah, in the first instance, this talk is the textual description. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Kylie. Um, well, I really liked what you were talking about. I mean, first of all, with the hash elements, I think that's so cool, especially like from the bio perspective, the hash can be thought of as like, you know, the connectivity of that neuron or whatever, similar to a projection function. So each of them have their own. Um, but for the, the varying dimensionality, um, again, kind of like getting back to the bio lens, it's really interesting to think of that in terms of hierarchical classes and kind of building like you have, you know, an object is a specific activation pattern in the brain, but then, you know, that object's class is many related patterns that then create this super manifold. So is that like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it's not really a question, but kind of a <laughs> musing, if you will, about. Yeah, I mean, uh, in fact, that was, um, I think the very first paper I did on this, uh, Back at the Bulgarian Analogy Conference with uh, Tony and, and Penty were there. Um, but uh, one of the points I made in that was I thought it was a useful interpretation to see what we're doing with VSA as being effectively creating virtual neurons. So that, you know, if you've, if you've got, you know, the old classic argument about oh, we've got, you know, cells that are tuned to this and cells that are tuned to that, and eventually people are saying, oh, I've got a cell that's tuned precisely to my grandmother's face, and a you know, cell that's, you know, tuned precisely to, um, you know, 
you know, quantum dot superconductors and, and, and all the rest of it, which seems a tad implausible um, because you literally would have to have a brain the size of a planet to have that many neurons. And because why should you know, evolution have pre-stocked your brain with you know, things like you know, cons neurons for the concept of you know, superconducting well, when it probably wasn't that relevant in Paleolithic times? Mm -hmm. But in, uh, you can view a binding as being equivalent to a virtual neuron. Uh, because so if you've got A bind B, you can think of A as defining the receptive field. So it's engaged by the other input patterns to the extent of the dot product of the other patterns with, with A. And if you are unbinding with that input, you're releasing B, which is your output, you know, which in normal sort of neuron world is conceived of as just being a, uh, a scalar magnitude. But because we're in VSA world, it's also got a direction, which is the label saying, and yet yeah, I am the grandmother neuron. And my, you know, my, my magnitude is my degree, for, degree of belief for the grandmother. So I think from a purely practical implementation point of view, we need to have virtualization in that sense of you do not want to be tying your conceptual cognitive mechanism to the hardware. You've got neurons dying all over the shop. You've got new, you, you need to be able to create new things. Uh, and you can't possibly afford to pre-stock the system with everything you could possibly represent. So you want this vastly overproductive representational system that would let you represent anything that you could conceivably run across, but you only create them and make use of them as the need arises. So it's just a more musing on the same area, I think. Is that, is that also your argument for Occam's razor then? Uh, no, but uh, it's, I mean, the Occam's razor one, is down to the fact that because we're working with a finite representational space, eventually we're going to run out of space. Uh, so that, um, and but, you know, we're more likely to run out of space for reasons of correlation of, of stimuli with each other. They're, they're, they're crowded locally rather than the entire space being, being full. Uh, but then just saying, yeah, because everything's just a value from the system's point of view, Certain classing you know, whole classes of um, of representations are just the same thing from um, uh, from the system's dynamical point of view, and then taking in Tony's point is saying, well, ideally, what you'd have is a mechanism which is which responds to the the decomposition of that label into things, and it would seem appropriate and useful that. Yeah, given you've got multiple decompositions that could arrive at, it's more likely to arrive at the simplest possible one. But, yeah. Chris. Um, yeah, so I'm going to frame this question in terms of like um, the like the decoding side yeah. of trying to get information back from the vectors, because I agree with the encoding part that, yeah. OK, it's very nice to be able to create new kinds of like, it's on the fly. Yeah. Um, so like one thing I've been just kind of thinking about offline a little bit is like, representing, for example, like list programs or yes. something like that yeah. uh, with a VSA vector. Yeah. And then um, we run into these kind of Fock and Razor problems that you're mentioning, namely yeah. that, okay, you've got the vector, now got to figure out which program is it running or what strings are decomposing yeah. it. Yeah. And then um, the nice thing about, or the like, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because you can represent lots of different uh, string sequences um, and maybe like an yeah. exponential number of them, but then decoding and yeah. searching in the exponential space, like good luck with that. So yeah. do you have thoughts or ideas on ways uh, to, I guess, I mean, it's kind of a tough problem. No, but, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, think I'd, I think I'd actually run it run it backwards. I think, yeah, well, you yeah, know, great, we can represent anything. Yeah. As you say, you know, the difficulty is in, is in decoding it. I would... I think we have a tendency to view things like a computer, a standard computer programmer would, and say, I am going to need to decode, to, to decode this in order to operate on it. Uh, and I wonder whether that's actually a necessary thing, and I wonder whether that is appropriate in VSA world. So if we can set up a system which does transformations of an encoded input to an encoded output, where the where the transformation is in some sense yeah, mathematically equivalent to having decoded and done something with it and then re-encoded it, but you don't actually do that on the fly. Um, 
that might be more appropriate. And then what I suspect you'd find is whatever mechanism you could come up with to implement that, there'd be this notion of reachability of transformations. So some set of transformations would be very easy for it to reach, and those would be the ones which correspond to you know, the simpler Occam's razor kind of decompositions, whereas, whereas the other ones are either not reachable or effectively equivalent to noise and, and get lost in the yeah. weeds. But yeah, you know, that, that's that's sort of hand wavy kind of stuff, but that's that that is where I would head with that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, no, it actually makes sense. And uh, I think some good cool. observations that are um, where, we, where you can do uh, operations like on 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 your vectors, just assuming they were this programs, then at some point, like compare them and see, okay, yeah, they actually look up to drones and, and you can actually retrieve structure or not, in, in which case you can just sort of them as, as noise or your lookup table will sort of them as noise. Um, in any case, um, I, I thought the North Pole distance was like actually a pretty good analogy because I've, I've been defining this as distance from a vector and a distance compared to a random vector. Yeah. Right? How many standard deviations am I away from yeah. this vector and how many standard deviations is this vector uh, away from being totally unrelated? Uh, and, and I think that's that helps a lot in, in programming. <laughs> And then the final uh, remark was you had the uh, XOR uh, permutes, right? The um, X, uh, XOR uh, row one, right? Uh, on, on, on some slide where you're combining XOR and permutes. Uh, it wasn't, or, wasn't XOR, but yeah, it was, yeah, in that case, it was just addition, but yeah. Addition. Yeah, it was an operation. <laughs> Whatever, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it's funny because this ties back to uh, if you want to implement this really efficiently, one thing you could do is is use like the uh, general linear uh, the uh, GF two instructions, um, which are matrix uh, vector addition, yeah. not not two instructions uh, that are used all over the place in, in cryptography, um, which begs the question: like, isn't this just a special case of uh, vector, like times a vector, uh, or times a matrix plus a vector, yeah. where yeah. Um, your matrix has a constraint of being a permutation. Uh, yeah, oh, and it's um, the, the, one of the difficulties with, with my approach to things is basically, it does come down to what I said initially, that, yeah, it, everything is kind of related to everything else. <laughs> and so, yeah, ultimately you say, yeah, well, you know, deep thoughts, this, that, and the other, this maps onto the other thing, boom. Oh, okay, so really, this is just that, big deal. Uh, but I, I think it's, you know, the path you take along the way might actually be useful in in, in evolving in evolving something. But, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, ultimately, it's, you know, it's mathematics under the under the hood. And, you know, you, you've got the, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. So it, it's, you know, I would expect that it, it would map onto a whole lot of other stuff. Um, and it's it's then our job as researchers to to try to exploit those mappings. Does does that make make it easier to to implement? Does that mean I can make it faster? Does that you know, it's sort of like category theory. You, you, you're carrying structure from one domain to another and seeing whether that gets you any further. So I um, suggest we, we continue the discussion uh, during the coffee break. So thank you, Rose, once again.